Drew King here with Hidden History New York, and I'm out here at Stony Point Battlefield, and we stumbled upon a blacksmith working at the uh, at the blacksmith setup. And um, sir, what's your yeah, name? My name is Ralph Lapidus, and I've uh, been portraying a British blacksmith here at the camp for about ten years. Uh, I'm a volunteer, and uh, I enjoy uh, metalworking. I used to teach at Felix Festa Middle School. Uh, the metalworking and woodworking, now it's called technology education. Uh, but uh, I took up the art of blacksmithing while there, and in retirement I've been coming up here uh, and sharing as much of my knowledge as I can and, uh, about blacksmithing uh, in, uh, right here at, at Stony Point in colonial times. Basically, the uh, process is you heat up the metal red hot, and then you have to hammer it into a shape. Uh, you have a limited time to work with the metal because uh, it cools off, and once it cools down from red hot, uh, it needs to be reheated again. Uh, the basic parts of my blacksmith area is a bellows, a forge, and an anvil. Now, this is a unique situation because uh, I'm portraying a blacksmith that was portable. Most blacksmiths during colonial times were not portable. They were in a building and you went to them in order to uh, have your work done. But in this case, the British blacksmith followed the troops. There were over a thousand troops here and was in charge of uh, anything that was made out of iron or steel. Now the blacksmith got their name because the color of the metal, once it cooled down from red hot, became black. It's an oxide that forms on the outside. The blacksmith uh, would be asked to make something and start out with a bar of square or rectangular uh, iron. And the iron that they used back there was wrought iron, almost pure iron. You can hardly find any of that anymore. The modern day uh, irons that they call iron is basically steel, which is iron plus other ingredients added to it. Uh, so that you heat up the metal red hot and then you hammer it. Now the blacksmith would learn their skills by apprenticing a master smith. And back in the day, a formal apprenticeship would last 10 years. You start at the age of eight and you'd work for 10 years along with the blacksmith until you learned everything that you could in order to start your own business and make a living uh, for yourself. Nail. The nail would be hammered right through the door, right through the wood, and then clinched, bent on the other side. Very strong. So they buy the iron like that. It's about a quarter of square. And then they would heat it up, and probably the person heating it up was the apprentice. So the blacksmith wouldn't go away from their, their station where they're going to work the anvil. They would be waiting for the hot metal to arrive to him. So there's less time wasting, because each second it's away from the fire, it's cooling down. Now notice I'm starting to pump the bellows. Watch what happens to fire now. This fire will burn over the melting point of the metal, over 2,300 degrees. How do I know? I've done it. <laughs> and uh, you, you, if you're good enough, you can bring it up to just where it is going to melt. And if you have two pieces, you can weld them together. And blacksmith, that was a you know, common thing to do, make big pieces out of little ones. You didn't waste any, the metal was expensive. Okay, so once this turns red hot, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a point on the end of this. I'm gonna hammer it into a point, turning it. And then I'm gonna make the body of the nail. I'm squeezing the metal out, making it longer and skinnier, the length of the nail I want. 
How do I know how long to make it? Somebody asked me to do it. We agreed on me making a certain length nail. I didn't go and make a bunch of nails and put them on a shelf like Home Depot. <laughs> okay, so now I've got the basic shape of the nail. I'm just going to hammer it, tap it. And this refines the shape a little bit and it takes a lot of the hammer marks out. But I'm not really trying to forge it into any other shape because it's not red hot anymore. I, I smoothed it down just by that tapping. It looks like a spear. Okay, so now this is the length of my nail, here to here. It has to fit into this tool. And if I didn't mention it, blacksmiths were tool makers. They made all the tools for all the other artisans and all the other people. So they worked with iron and steel. This is called a header. And that fits right down in to the transition that I made. And now I have to cut it off and make the head of the nail. Now, back in the day, a person who did this all day long would be working on their fifth or sixth nail by now. You may expect to make a nail with one heat of the metal and every 30 seconds. Okay, now I cut this off using this tool. It's like a chisel. Okay, it's called a hardy. It fits into the anvil. Now I have to reheat this again. And by the way, there's an old saying, strike while the iron's hot. If you've ever heard of that, it comes from the blacksmith. It has a little different meaning now, but back then it actually meant that you have to work it when it's red hot. There's another old saying that comes from the blacksmith, very common. It's called having too many irons in the fire. And if you have too many irons in the fire, you'll have a, you know, Forget about one, it'll burn up, or overheat. Okay, so now this is red again. I'm going to leave some metal. I'm cutting almost all the way through, not quite off. Put it into the header, break it off the rest of the way, and then hammer the head. Now the last four strokes, give it a design. Again, blacksmiths want to make things that were aesthetically pleasing. This is called a four clout nail. It has facets on it like a diamond. Oh, wow. oh, cool. That's just a standard. Um, supply me and all, all uh, the materials I needed uh, to do my job. So I would uh, be taking along, you know, on, in ships, across the ocean, everything I needed. And some, of course I needed fuel. And the fuel that they took was coal. Yeah. And uh, I am using coal here for my forge to be authentic. Now if I was a colonial blacksmith in this area, in Rockland County, there was no coal mines. So I would be using charcoal instead. It's just uh, 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 the uh, resource that was available. Charcoal is just as good as coal. It burns the same. It's carbon. And when that carbon burns, it reaches temperatures up to 3,000 degrees if you have the proper you know, air uh, fo forcing into the fire. many people who uh, believe that. However, I found out that there were many female blacksmiths. And not that females are, are not as strong, but it, it, it's technique more than it is strength. So you're talking about, you know, how hot to get the metal, where to hit it, and how to hit it. So if you, you know, if, if you're knowledgeable, knowledgeable about that, it doesn't mean that you have to be large to do it. There are 
associations of blacksmiths that meet on a regular basis basis uh, in New York and uh, there are associations uh, that are uh, worldwide. Uh, one of the uh, associations that I belong to is the Northeast Blacksmith Association. They meet in Ashoka near Kingston, New York. Uh, there's the New York State De Designer Blacksmiths, and they have uh, regular meetings around the state and, you know, different, uh, 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 different, different uh, individual uh, counties also, you know, uh, group together. And all, all it takes is uh, a search on the internet and you will find it. And the National Association is called the uh, American Blacksmiths Association of uh, North America. Uh, and they have, uh, you know, annual uh, big meetings where they uh, have people from all over the world come and demonstrate. Hammering, you lose your heat, you have to reheat. Because if you're hitting a, a piece of metal that is below red hot, you're putting stress in the metal and you're wasting your energy. Back in the day, uh, people, a lot of people uh, maybe only had one pair of shoes or maybe didn't, couldn't even afford a pair of shoes. So here's a typical you know, a shoe from the period. And on the back, on the bottom, in the heel, it's called a heel plate. And uh, in order to preserve the heel, the leather from wearing out quickly, uh, the person would bring the uh, shoe to the blacksmith. The blacksmith would then make a heel plate and I am not sure if the blacksmith would actually apply the plate to the shoe or actually bring it to the cobbler to do. Because back then, there was a, uh, a separation of, of uh, skills and, and of, uh, of uh, almost like the unions of today. Right, you you make the heel plate, the cobbler puts it on, puts it on right. and yeah. the shoe. You, you didn't want to step on anybody else's shoes. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Very good. Listen, thank you very much for the uh, for your time today, and uh, it was fantastic watching you give a uh, give a live demo. And again, we're out here at Stony Point Battlefield, out in Stony Point, New York, and it's definitely worth a visit.